Section 17 of Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories 5, May 1930. Section 17 The Atom Smasher by Victor Rousseau. Chapter 3 Into the Infinite. How long he sat there he did not know. Minutes or hours seemed all the same to him. Nothing but that gray monochrome, of neither light nor darkness, that endless panorama of miles and years, blended together into this chaos. But suddenly there came a shout from Tota. The blur ceased, the lights flickered. Again there sounded the two thumps of the electrical discharge. The vibrating mechanism grew steady. Above them, out of the grayness, a moon disclosed itself, then the pinpoints of stars. All about them was an immense sandy waste. "'Know where we are, Dent?' came Toda's chuckle. Jim was not sufficiently master of himself to attempt to answer. "'We are on what will be the Russian steppes some fifty thousand years ahead of us in time,' grinned Toda. "'This is an interlude between two ice ages.' Observe how pleasantly warm the climate is for Russia. Unfortunately, the receding glaciers carried off the topsoil, which accounts for the barrenness of the district. But in another century this country will be overgrown with ferns, and inhabited by the mastodon and wild horse, and a few enterprising Paleolithic hunters, who will come in to track them down and destroy them with their stone axes. I think you're the same sort of damn liar you always were, Tota answered Jim, but without conviction. There was something terrific about that desolation. Nothing within a thousand miles of Long Island corresponded to it. "'You'll be convinced pretty quickly when you see my specimen,' answered Tota. "'I let him off here on the way to the pool. He's not exactly presentable, and when I got the idea of picking up Lucille and taking her back with me, I thought it best not to let her see him. He didn't want to be let off, was afraid I wouldn't pick him up again, and I'll admit it was a matter of pretty careful reckoning. But this is the place, almost to the yard. Yes, I've done some close reckoning, Dent, but the cleverest part of the business was letting old Parrish think he'd got away from me. I knew he'd telephone Lucille. You know, I always had the brains of the outfit, Dent, he continued, with a smirk of self-satisfaction. He looked out of the boat. And here, if I'm not mistaken... "'Comes my specimen,' he added. "'Something was running across the steps toward them. "'It came nearer, took human form. "'It was human. "'A man. "'But such a man as Jim had never seen before "'outside the covers of a book, "'and he recognized the race immediately. "'It was a Neanderthal man, "'one of the race that coexisted "'with the highly developed Cro-Magnons "'some thirty thousand years ago. "'Man, and not ape, "'though the face was bestial, and there were huge ridges above the eyebrows. And if Jim had needed conviction, the sight of this gibbering creature, now climbing into the boat and fawning upon Tota, convinced him. For the Neanderthal man vanished from the scene long before the beginning of recorded history. For a few moments a deathly faintness overcame him. His eyes closed. He felt unconsciousness rushing in upon him like a black cloud. "'It's all right, Dent. Don't look so scared,' came Tota's mocking voice. Jim opened his eyes, shook off that cloud of darkness with an immense effort. The boat was throbbing violently as the wheels gyrated. The violet light had become a pillar as thick as a man, and shot straight up to a height of fifty feet before it rolled away. Lucille was lying where she had been, her eyes still staring up unseeing at the stars. Old Parrish was whining and whimpering as he crouched in his place. And at Toto's feet crouched the Neanderthal man, repulsive, bestial, even though hardly formidable, and filling the last vacant spot inside the boat. He was gibbering and mouthing as he fawned upon Toda, and pressed his hand to his hairy face. He continued to crouch and looked up at his master with dog-like eyes. Repulsive, and yet man, not ape distinctly human, perhaps a little lower than the Australian aborigine, 
the Neanderthal showed by his reverence that the human faculty of worship existed in him. "'Meet Cain, one of my Drilgos,' said Tota, with a grin. "'A faithful servant. I left him here to wait for me on the return journey. Cain's just my pet name for him because he subsists on the fruits of the earth. Don't you, Cain?' The Drilgo grunted and pressed Tota's hand to his repulsive lips, which were fringed with a reddish beard. Suddenly Tota began to laugh uproariously. "'Feel anything wrong with your head, Dent?' he asked. Dent put up his hand and pulled away a quantity of charred hair. His forehead began to itch, and, rubbing his finger across it, he realized that his eyebrows were gone. Tota laughed still louder. "'You've kept your teeth by about two seconds grace, Dent, but I shouldn't be surprised if you needed dental attention shortly,' he said. What a pity dentists won't be invented for another forty or fifty thousand years. You're a devil, cried Jim. You see, the human body is very resistant to the ray, Toto went on. It almost seems as if there is an organizing principle within it. Even the animal tissues are resistant, though not to the same extent as the human ones. It takes about twenty seconds for the organized human form to be disintegrated but hair and beaks and claws, being superficial matter, vanish almost as soon as the ray is turned on them. Ten seconds more, and you'd have been obliterated, Dent, just as your plane was. Yes, rub your head. Your hair will probably grow again, if I decide to let you live. It rather depends on what impression you make upon Lucille as a bald-headed hero. After all, I didn't invite you to accompany us. It's your own lookout." Jim could find nothing to say to that. He was discovering more and more that they were all helpless in Tota's hands. "'Sit back!' snarled Tota suddenly. He gave the Drilgo a push that sent him sprawling into the bottom of the boat. "'Dent, your life depends upon your absolute acquiescence to my proposals. I didn't like you particularly in the old days, any more than you liked me. I thought you were a fool. On the other hand... I've no active reason to hate you at present. It may be that I can use you. Meanwhile, we've got a longish journey before us, ten thousand years more, multiplied by the fourth power of two thousand miles. Seems simple? Well, I had to invent the mathematical process for it. Reckon in the gravitational attraction of the planets, and you'll begin to get an idea of the complexity of it. So, in vulgar parlance, we're not likely to arrive till morning." He glanced at Lucille, who was still lying unconscious with Jim's arm about her. Then his eyes rose to meet Jim's, and a sneering smile played about his lips. That smile was the acknowledgment of their rivalry for the girl's affections. And it was more. It was a challenge. Toto welcomed that rivalry because, Jim could see, he meant to keep him alive under conditions of servitude, to demonstrate to Lucille his superiority. Tota turned his thumbscrews, and the two thuds resounded. The violet column sank down, the boat vibrated, the level stretch of land became a blur again. The moon and stars vanished. Once more the four were off on that terrific journey. At first they seemed to be traversing space that was shot through by alternate light and darkness, so that at times Jim could see the other occupants of the boat clearly, while at other times there was only Tota visible at the instrument board, with the dark outlines of the Drilgo, Cain, sprawled at his feet. But soon these streaks seemed to come closer and closer together, until the duration of each was only a fraction of a second, and closer, until light and darkness blended into a universal gray. These, Jim knew, were the alternations of night and day. They were traveling, incredible as it was, in time as well as space, though whether backward or forward Jim could not know. From the presence of the Neanderthal man, however, Jim was convinced that Toto was taking them back more thousands of years into the beginnings of humanity. A fearful journey, a madder journey than Jim could have conceived of had he not been a participant in it. He was losing all sense of reality. He was hardly convinced that he would not awaken in New York to discover that the whole episode had been a dream. Was this Lucille, the girl he loved? with whom he had dined in New York only a day or two before. This unconscious form, stretched out on the deck of the weird ship that was rushing through eternity? Or rather, 
It was they who were rushing through space and time upon a stationary ship. What was reality, and what was dream, then? Tota called, Come over here, Dent. I want to talk to you. Jim picked his way over the metal floor of the round boat, came up to Tota, and sat down beside him above the sprawling form of the Drilgo, Kane. You were a fool to come here, Dent. Tota turned with a malicious smile from his seat at the instrument board. You didn't have to come. I take it that you were in love with Lucille, you poor imbecile, and still cherish dreams of winning her. We'll take up that matter in due course. Do you think I've been idle during these five years of my exile? I've been too busy even to come back for the woman I was in love with. And do you know what I've been doing during all this hellish period? Charting courses, Dent. Mapping out all the planetary movements back for uncounted ages. Roughly, crudely, of course, but the best I was able to. These are difficult seas to navigate, though they may not seem so. You fool, he added savagely. Why didn't you come in with me in the old days? I told you that the Atom Smasher could be used to travel through time, and you mocked me as a dreamer. I chose my hour. When everything was ready, I set forth on the most desperate journey ever attempted by man. Talk of Columbus, he had nothing on me. I tell you, Dent, I've been back to the Archean Age, back to the time when nothing but crawling worms moved on the face of the Earth and I've been forward to the time when an errant planet will disrupt the Earth into a shower of lava. And I nearly wrecked the boat, Dent. I've won, Dent. I've won. I have solved the problem that gives man immortality. All the epochs that have existed since God first formed the world are mine to play with. I have seen myself as a puling infant and as a graybeard. I have made myself immortal because, with this machine, I can set back the clock of time. I have found a land where I'm worshipped as a god. Toda's eyes glittered with maniacal fires. He went on in a voice of indescribable triumph. I'm a god there, Dent. Do you want to know where that land is? It is Atlantis, sunk beneath the waves nine thousand years before recorded history opened. It is Atlantis, from which the Cro-Magnons fled in their ships, to land on the coasts of Spain and France and became the ancestors of modern man. In old Atlantis, still not wholly submerged, I have made myself a god. I have mastered the savage Drilgos whom the Atlanteans oppressed. All the spoils of their ruined cities are at my disposal. And I came back to get Lucille, whom I had never ceased to love. Together Lucille and I will rule like god and goddess. Join me, Dent. I'm a god in Atlantis. A god, I tell you. The lesser races fear me as a supernatural being. Only the city remains uncaptured, but it is mine whenever I choose to take it. A god. A god. A god! Jim saw now what he had not realized before. That Tota was insane. It would, indeed, have been a miracle if he had been able to retain his sanity under such circumstances as he had described. His voice rose into a wild scream. Yes, Toto was mad. Just such a madman as any of the old Roman emperors, drunk with power, each in his turn the sole ruler of the world. The earth is mine, Toto screamed. Before the modern world was dreamed of, before the nations were created, Atlantis was the sole power that held dominion over the scattered tribes of mankind, and she is in my hand whenever I strike. Wealth incalculable, treasures such as man has never since seen, marvels of scientific discovery, flying machines that would make ours look foolish, paintings grander than have since been executed. All these things exist in the proud city that will shortly be at my command. And I have my Drilgos, the inferior race, to serve me. They worship me because they know I am a god. Join me, Dent and taste the joys of being one of the supreme rulers of the world. In spite of his undoubted madness, there was such power in Tota's voice that Jim could not help believe what he had said. Well, snarled Tota, you hesitate to give me your answer, Dent? Lucille and I are engaged to be married, answered Jim, and the words were drawn from his lips almost against his will. We love each other. I'm not going to lie to you and then betray you, Tota. The expression on Tota's face was demoniacal. 
He snatched up the deadly tube that contained the violet fire and turned it upon Jim. Again Jim felt that repulsive force pushing him back. He gasped for breath and tensed his whole body in supreme resistance while he tried to grapple with Tota in vain. But suddenly Tota dropped the tube and a roar of laughter broke from his lips. You fool, he shouted. I tell you I am a god, the one god, supreme above all. Do you think to match your puny will against my own? I tell you Lucille is mine, and forever, Dent. Whenever we two have reached old age, all that will be necessary for us to do will be to turn this screw a hair's breadth back into the past, and we are both young again. By holding this vessel steady in four-dimensional space, I can achieve immortality. Yes, Tota, answered Jim. But, you see, that's the one thing that you haven't been able to work out yet. The words seemed to come automatically from Jim's lips. It was only after he had spoken them that he realized they were true. For a moment Tota glared at him. Then suddenly, with a shriek of insane rage, he leaped from the instrument board and swung the ray tube with all his might. Jim felt the blow descend with stunning force upon his head. He reeled, flung out his arms, and toppled forward, unconscious. End of Chapter 3 Chapter 4 Escape An intolerably bright light that seemed to sear his eyeballs was the first thing of which Jim was conscious. Then he became aware of his aching head, of a sense of utter lassitude, as if he had been bruised all over in some machine that had caught him up and held him in its grip for endless aeons. At last, despite the pain in his eyes, he managed to get his eyelids open. He tried to struggle to his feet, only to discover that he was firmly bound with what appeared to be tough creepers pliant as ropes. After the lapse of a few minutes, during which he struggled with the receding waves of unconsciousness, he came to a realization of his surroundings. That light that had so distressed him, though the effects were now beginning to pass off, was a pillar of smoke and flame shooting out of the crater of a volcano about a mile away, across a valley. He was lying in the entrance to a cave, pegged out on his back, and bound by the tough creepers to the stakes driven into the ground. Up to the mouth of the cave grew huge tree ferns, cattails, cycads, and such growths as existed in earlier ages in the warm, moist regions of the world. Beneath the level of the cave, a heavy white fog completely shrouded the valley, extending up to within a short distance of the volcano opposite but on the upper slopes of the volcano the sunlight played, making its crater a sheen of glassy lava, intolerably bright. Beyond the volcano Jim could see what looked like an expanse of ocean. He groaned, and at the sound a creature came shambling forward, carrying what looked like a huge melon in either hand. Jim recognized the Drilgo, Kane. Chattering and mumbling, Kane placed one of the fruits to Jim's mouth. It was a sort of bread fruit, but he was too nauseated to eat, and rejected it with disgust. Cain offered him the second fruit. It was a hollow gourd, the interior filled with a clear fluid. Jim drank greedily as the Drilgo put it to his lips. The contents were like water, but slightly acid. Jim felt refreshed. He looked about him. The Drilgo uttered a chattering call, and immediately a host of the savages swarmed into the cave. Men, undoubtedly men, in spite of the brow ridges and the receding foreheads, carrying long spears, consisting of chipped and pointed heads of stone, with holes bored in them, through which long bands of creepers passed, fastening them firmly to the shaft. Chattering and gesticulating, the Drilgos surrounded Jim as he lay helpless on the ground. Their savage faces, their rolling eyes, the threatening gestures that they made with their spears, convinced Jim that his end was a foregone conclusion. But suddenly a distant rumbling sound was heard, increasing rapidly in volume. The floor of the cave vibrated. Masses of rock dropped from the walls. The light of the volcano across the valley was suddenly obscured in an immense cloud of black smoke. The twilight within the cave was succeeded by almost impenetrable darkness. Shrieking in terror, the Drilgos bolted, while Jim lay straining at his ropes, expecting each moment to be crushed by the masses of rock that were falling all about him. Suddenly a soft whisper came to Jim through the darkness. Jim, are you safe? Where are you? 
I can't see you. Speak to me. It was Lucille's voice, and Jim called back, husky and tremulous, in the sheer joy that had succeeded his anticipation of instant death. Then he felt the girl kneeling at his side, and heard her hacking at his bonds. A whole minute passed before the stone knife was able to sever the last of the stout withes, however. Then Jim was swaying on his feet, and Lucille's arms were about him, and for a few moments their fears were forgotten in the renewal of their love. "'I heard what the devil said to you last night,' the girl said. "'He means to kill you with awful tortures. He is away now, on some task or other, but he'll be back at any moment. We must get away at once, we three. Dad's in another cave not far away, and his guards bolted after the earthquake.' The earth was still rumbling, and the cavern still vibrating but it was clear that there was no time to lose. As soon as the quake subsided, the Drilgos would return. Guided by Lucille, Jim groped his way through the cavern. The girl called softly at intervals, and presently Jim heard old Parrish's answering call. Then the old man's form appeared in silhouette against the dark. "'I've got Jim,' Lucille whispered. "'Are you ready, Dad?' "'Yes, yes, I'm ready,' chattered the old man. "'Now's our chance.' I know a place where we can hide in the thick forests, where the ray of the Atlanteans cannot penetrate the mists. Let's go, let's go. Gripping hands, the three started back toward the point where a faint patch of darkness showed out the entrance to the cavern. They were nearing it when another and more violent shock flung them upon their faces. Huge masses of rock came hurtling down from the roof and sides of the cavern, and again the three seemed to escape by a miracle. Suddenly a huge shaft of fire shot from the crater opposite, evolving into an inverted cone that made the whole land dazzlingly bright. It pierced the mists in the valley underneath, and by that light Jim could see a great wave of lava streaming down the mountain's sides, like soup spilled out of a bowl. A gush of black smoke followed, and the light went out. Now, gasped Parrish, and clinging to one another, the three darted out of the cavern's entrance. Another terrific shock sent them stumbling and reeling and sprawling down the side of the mountain. Jim heard old Parrish wailing, and as the shock subsided, groped his way to his side. "'You hurt?' he shouted. "'Lucille, Lucille,' moaned the old man. "'She's dead. A big rock crushed her. I wish I was dead, too.' Jim called Lucille's name frantically, and to his immense relief heard her crying faintly out of the darkness. He rushed to her side and held her in his arms. "'Where are you hit, darling?' "'I'm all right,' she panted. "'I was stunned for a moment. I can go on now.' But she went limp in Jim's arms, and Jim picked her up and stood, irresolute, until he heard Paris shambling toward him over the heaving ground. "'She's not hurt, I think, only fainted,' said Jim. "'Which way, Parrish? You lead us.' "'Down the slope,' panted Parrish. "'We'll be in the ferns in a minute. We can hide there for a while.' till she's able to walk. God help us all. And I was once professor of physical chemistry at Columbia. The outcry might have seemed comical under other circumstances. As it was, Jim heartily re-echoed old Parrish's sentiments in his heart. The last shock was subsiding in faint earth tremors. The two men plunged down into the heavy fog which quickly covered them, Jim carrying Lucille in his arms. He felt the ferny undergrowth all about him, the thick bowls of tree-ferns emerged out of the mist. "'We can stop here for a while,' panted Parrish. "'Crouch down. They'll never find us in this fog, and in a few minutes, when Lucille's better, we can go on.' "'You must tell me where we are and what our chances are,' said Jim, after again ascertaining that Lucille was unharmed. "'I'll tell you, Dent, as quick as I can. It's the place where I've spent five years of hell as the slave of that devil, Tota. I never dreamed—' when we were working on the old Adam Smasher, that he had adapted it to travel in the fourth dimension. He's taken us back twelve thousand years or so to the island of Atlantis. History hasn't begun yet. Atlantis is the only civilization in the world. The rest are Drilgos, Neanderthal men, wandering in the forests and still in their stone age. It's true, Dent, what old Plato learned from the Egyptian priests. Atlantis has been slowly sinking for thousands of years, and all that's left now is the one great island that we're on. Nearly all the Atlanteans, the Cro-Magnon men, have perished, 
except for a few who have crossed in ships to the coasts of France and Spain. They'll be the founders of modern Europe, Basques and Iberians, and Bretons and Welshmen. Our ancestors! It makes my brain reel to think of it. Go on, go on, said Jim. There's a great city on the island, known as Atlantis too, as big as London or New York, with flying machines and temples and art galleries and big ships that they're building to carry them away when the next subsidence comes. They know they're doomed, for every few days there's an eruption now. Toda means to make himself master of Atlantis, and transport it into another epoch by means of the Atom Smasher, but he's never managed to enter. He's made himself a god in the eyes of the Drilgos, the savages who inhabit these forests. He's planning to lead them against the city, and he's got an army of thousands from all parts of the interior who worship him as divine. The Atlanteans are unwarlike. They've forgotten how to fight in their thousands of years of peace. But they've got a ray ten times as strong as Toda's that brings instant death to everything it touches. It shrivels it up. It's a different principle. I don't understand it. But it's this ray that keeps the Drilgos from capturing the city. Toda's got a laboratory inside the cave, fitted up with apparatus that he brought from Chicago, the world capital of the year 3000 A.D., after disintegrating the atoms and recombining them. But he hasn't succeeded altogether. He hasn't learned everything. The future isn't quite clear like the past. There's a dark cloud moves across the spectral lines and blurs them. I think it's the element of free will. Or God. I know, Jim answered. He can't hold that boat steady in four-dimensional space, as he pretends he can. If he could, it would mean that man was wholly master of his destiny. He can't, and he never will. There's an unknown quantity comes in, Parrish. It is God, and that's what's going to beat him in the end. I've not been as idle as Toda thinks, said Parrish, with a senile leer. I know more about the Atom Smasher than he dreams of. He thinks me just an old fool, the remnants of whose brains are useful to him in his laboratory. That's why he's kept me alive so far. He'll find out his mistake, he chuckled. I have something Toda doesn't dream of. Suddenly Parrish's air of intense seriousness vanished. He chuckled and fumbled in his rags. Jim felt a small object like a lever pressed into his hand and then withdrawn. It's death, Dent, chuckled old Parrish. The concentrated essence of the destructive principle. It's a lever I fitted into a concealed groove in the Atom Smasher, unknown to Toda. This lever has a universal joint and connects with a hidden chamber, and when pulled will catapult the annihilated components of a small quantity of uranium in any direction we desire. The release of the slumbering energy of this uranium will produce an explosion of proportions beyond the wildest dreams of engineers. Perhaps one great enough to throw the Earth out of its orbit. Uranium! Breaking up its components! gasped Jim. You mean you can actually do that? Yes! chuckled Parrish. I'm keeping it for the day when Toda becomes a god, when he steadied the boat in time-space and halted the march of the past. And when he's got Lucille, then... Dent, I shall so pull the lever that it will release the energy straight at Toda and destroy the Atom Smasher, ourselves, and even perhaps the whole Earth. And he burst into a peal of such wild laughter that Jim realized the old man's wits were gone. Was it true, that amazing story? It was difficult to know, and yet anything seemed possible in this amazing world into which Jim had suddenly been thrown. The vast pall of smoke cast out by the volcano was beginning to subside. Slowly, a spectral light began to filter through the valley. Through the fog, Jim could see glimpses of the ferny undergrowth, the giant tree ferns and cycads that towered aloft. It was like a picture of the earth when the mastodons, the grass-eaters, and the meat-eaters disputed for its supremacy. Jim bent over Lucille. He saw her stir. He heard her murmur his name. Suddenly she sat up fixed her eyes on his, and shuddered. "'I'm all right, Jim. Let's go,' she said. "'I can walk now.' She staggered to her feet. Jim put out his hand to support her, but she shook her head. Jim touched old Parrish on the arm. He started and uttered a wild screech, then seemed to come to himself and rose. 
but that screech of his was re-echoed from the mountainside above. Other voices took up the echoes. Lucille clutched at Jim in a frenzy of fear. The Drogos, she whispered. They're on our trail. Seizing old Parrish by the arm, Jim started to drag him into the recesses of the fern forest. Suddenly the bestial face of a Drilgo appeared. A yell broke from the man's throat. The hairy arm shot back. Jim saw the stone tip of the long spear poised overhead. He leaped forward, delivering a blow in the man's midriff with all the strength of his right arm. The Drilgo grunted and doubled forward, the spear falling from his hand. The heavy head of stone embedded itself in the soft ground so that the spear remained upright. As the man collapsed, he yelled at the top of his voice. "'This way! This way!' gibbered old Parrish, suddenly alert. But now the undergrowth all about them was alive with Drilgos. The three dodged and doubled like hunted hares. High overhead, something began to clack with a sound like that made by a woodpecker drilling a tree, but infinitely louder. And out of the void above came Tota's voice, shouting commands to the Drilgos in their own language. Suddenly a column of fire shot up from the volcano, infusing the white mists with a reddish glare. Overhead, the three could see Tota. He was flying with a pair of mechanical wings strapped to his shoulders, not more than two hundred feet above them. With a shout of triumph he swooped down. In his hand was a small cylinder, about the mouth of which a phosphorescent violet light was beginning to play. "'I've got you, Dent!' he screamed in triumph, hovering above the three, while the wings drummed and vibrated till they seemed the mere play of light and shadow about Toda's shoulders. "'Halt, or I'll blast your body and soul to hell! Halt, or I'll kill her!' The deadly tube was pointing steadily at Lucille's body as Toda hovered ten feet overhead, perfectly still save for the whirring wings. The three stopped dead, and Toto, with a shout of triumph, began calling the Drilgos, who swarmed forward out of the undergrowth. Huge brown bodies, nude save for their skins of jungle cat or serpent, they emerged, quickly forming a ring about the three prisoners. Toto fluttered to the ground. Fools! Did you think you could escape that way? he asked. As for you, Dent, I'm going to convince you of the reality of four-dimensional space, as you would not be convinced in the old days. Do you know what I'm going to do with you? I'm going to strip the skin from you with the ray, and take you into the anatomical room at Columbia University and leave you there as an exhibit, Dent. Tota grinned like a madman. But Jim was looking past him, at something that had suddenly appeared upon the far horizon. It was a round disk of bluish-white, a disk like the moon, but slightly smaller, a disk that flickered as if it had an eyelid that was being winked repeatedly. Simultaneously, screams broke from the throats of all the Drilgos. They stampeded. Toto whirled about and saw. With a curse, he leaped into the air and whirred away. Out of that disk, a slender, blue-white beam shot suddenly, driving a pathway through the fog and disclosing the dark depths of the valley. "'The eye! The eye!' screeched Parrish. "'Down on the ground! Down! Down!' He dropped, and Jim caught Lucille and flung himself headlong with her. To and fro overhead, but only a few feet above them, moved the searchlight. Shrieks broke from the Drilgo's throats as they scattered through the jungle. Everywhere that ray moved, trees and undergrowth simply disappeared. A bunch of Drilgos caught by it were obliterated in an instant. Great gaps were left through the undergrowth as the ray passed. It faded as quickly as it had come, and instantly old Parrish was on his feet, dragging at his daughter. Now! Now! he babbled, heading along one of the burned tracks through the undergrowth. Jim seized Lucille, and the two raced in the wake of old Parrish. Behind them they could hear the Drilgos shouting, but a dense, impenetrable darkness was already beginning to settle down over the valley. They lost the track and went crashing through the ferns, on and on, until all was silence about them. Suddenly Parrish went down like a log. He lay breathing heavily, completely exhausted. When Jim spoke to him, a feeble muttering was the only answer. Jim and Lucille dropped to the ground, exhausted beside him. End of Chapter 4 Reading by Allison Stewart, Concord, California.